Well, thanks very much to the Rock Center um, and to the Law School and Business School for hosting this uh, three-part series on shareholder activism. Tonight's the first night of three sessions on, on the topic. Um, just uh, real quick, I think we're going to try to work through some presentation materials and we're going to save time at the end for questions. If there's something you don't understand along the way, obviously feel free to raise your hand, but otherwise hopefully we can get into some interesting discussion more toward the end of the, the conversation. Um, I'm Abe Friedman, that's Mason Morfitt, and uh, let me just kind of quickly walk you through the three sessions so you have a sense of, um, uh, Mason, can you just forward one, one slide? Um, so you have a sense of kind of what we're doing. So tonight we're gonna try to just plow a bunch, through a bunch of information, try to give you as much as we can uh, sort of an overview of the history around shareholder activism, around sort of what does the shareholder activism process look like, what are some of the issues out there, and, and you know, kind of give you a sense of the landscape around shareholder activism. We're gonna talk, talk about the different players, how they're relevant, how they interact with each other or don't interact with each other, and just try to get you familiar with sort of the base, the base, the building blocks that we're gonna use, hopefully in sessions two and three, where we can dive in and tell you some stories and really kind of give you a sense of shareholder activism come to life. What is, what is it really like? What is it like in the trenches? What are the kinds of things that big institutional investors are thinking about, that activists are thinking about, that companies are thinking about, and, and really try to, try to walk you through it. So tonight is kind of background in history. Next week is, uh, next Monday, same time, but at the business school, um, is non-contested situations, a little behind the scenes influence, what's, what's really happening that you don't know about, that you're not seeing out there, but it is happening, and how is it, what's the impact of it? And then finally, the, the third session should be uh, focused on contested situations, things that you would have potentially heard about and seen about, but hopefully we'll give you a few stories and kind of make it interesting and help you um, see it through our, our lens a little bit. Um, and, and, and the idea, ho hopefully by the end, is to have given you a sense about the way in which shareholder activism is really changing the landscape in the investment world. And when we go through the history timeline, you'll see that, that shareholder activism has sort of been bubbling up over a very long period of time, but in the last decade, it has absolutely transformed. And I would argue, and I think Mason would agree, in the next five to 10 years, it's only gonna keep ramping up. And, uh, and hopefully we'll give you a glimpse about what that's doing and why you should care. Yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna take a quick, quick step back and, and, and elaborate a little bit on my bio and why and why I'm here and you know, whether you can decide for yourself whether I'm worth listening to. But um, so Value Act is an uh, $8 billion uh, investment partnership today. And it was zero when we started it um, 12 years ago uh, in 2000. And I think Abe and I are both fortunate to have lived in um, what I think are some of the most interesting and, and fast moving times in the world of corporate governance. I would argue that the decade 2002 to 2012 has seen more change than the uh, 90 years prior to that. And, and that is something we're gonna try to tease out later in the presentation today, but, but um, when we started Value Act, the, the, it was an idea that you could invest in companies and, and think like an owner and exercise the rights of ownership and, and buy stocks in the open market and then ultimately serve on the board of directors and um, change how companies are, are run, which at the time, was a um, tough sell to investors because it, it really wasn't done. And, and the corporate community didn't really want or feel um, obliged to accommodate what we, were, what we were trying to do. And if you fast forward to today, we've been on 30 public company boards. I've been on five public company boards, uh, market caps ranging up to um, almost $20 billion companies and, and uh, have, have had, um, uh, a, a reasonable amount of success, um, changing out CEOs, um, changing business strategies, changing business portfolio, recapitalizing companies, and and, um, and and it's been a great ride. But it's been really enabled by the macro environment, which is something we're going to get into a little bit later. Maybe yeah, maybe I should just say really quickly a little bit about my background too. Just I know um, Evan introduced us both, but but BlackRock, for those of you who don't know it, I, I was I left BlackRock last year, and I'm working on starting a new uh, investment firm, and I've also been doing some advice around corporate governance in the meantime. But 
Um, BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager. It manages about 3.5 trillion, about at least 3.5 trillion when I left. I think it's a little higher now. Um, and um, a huge portion of that is in equities. And BlackRock, as a result, is one of the largest, if not the largest, shareholder of just about every major company around the globe. My responsibility was to lead a team of people who would vote our shares on behalf of our clients and engage with the companies where we held an interest. So, so you know, any you, th you name the big company that you can think of um, out there, BlackRock is probably one of the top two or three shareholders. My, our job was to engage with those companies, with their boards, with their management team, to represent the shareholder, uh, the, the, our clients as, our, as the shareholder of that company, and to try to encourage them to behave in ways that were friendly and focused on the interests of investors. I did that at Barclays Global Investors before BlackRock, and before that, I was at Glass Lewis and Company. We'll talk about Glass Lewis later, but Glass Lewis is one of the two proxy research firms in the country that advise investors on how they should vote in these sorts of situations. And I was one of the founding partners there and built the proxy research business. So Mason, you want to dive in from there? Sure. So what we're going to try to get through today is, is lay out some of the themes that we, we hope to draw out today and, and in the following weeks. Quickly uh, get you guys up to speed on the issues, processes, and players. And uh, I actually think we're going to spend a lot of time on the history, because the history um, is where Abe and I can weave in some of our personal anecdotes and, 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 um, and make this come a little bit alive for you. The themes that uh, we want to hammer home today are, are, number one, the trend is clear and it's in one direction, and that is empowering uh, shareholders. Um, We'll get into this again a little bit uh, in the history lesson. Uh, number two is that activism works. The, the returns associated with it um, uh, allow you to beat the market. Um, but, but maybe more importantly, it's, it's very effective at getting corporate behavior to change. And, and number three, and this, this is an important one, and everybody really wants to talk about the latest uh, scandal of the day or the sexy conflict that's going on in the Wall Street Journal. That, that is just a small, small minority of, of shareholder activism. And as our firm evolved from um, through the last decade, we, we've, we've tried and, and failed and tried and succeeded a lot of different things. Um, we've done proxy fights. We've done uh, public campaigns. We've done very media-driven uh, efforts. But we found that the most effective thing we can do is working behind the scenes and building on our network in, in a collegial spirit um, influence companies. And so the lion's share of our, of our success is due to stuff that you have no idea ever happened. And uh, I think Abe would say the same thing about BlackRock. So that's, that's something we want to uh, um, communicate to you. And this, this may be one of the few venues where it's actually talked about in public, all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And I just want to, before I jump into process real, um, issues real quick, I just want to say when Mason says activism works, it's not just that Mason's firm, which has been extraordinarily successful in terms of activism, um, has worked. It's that the best empirical research that's out there, and hopefully we'll get some of that in front of you and have, give you a chance to read it and talk about it in the, the two classes that are coming up um, out there on this topic, shows that activism does generate excess returns. And, it, and those returns are sticky. They don't just go away um, you know, uh, one month, two months, six months, one year later. Those returns seem to be enduring, uh, according to the best empirical research we can find out there. Um, all right, so what are the issues in activism? Uh, what are we talking about? What, what, is, what is activism? Well, it, the, 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 this, there's a spectrum in activism, just like there's a spectrum in most things in life, right? And on, on, the, on the, spe the spectrum, you go from everything from issues that you know, I would characterize as not particularly economically driven, they could have an economic impact, by the way. I'm not suggesting that a non-economic issue doesn't have an economic impact. I'm just saying the motivation for engaging with the company about it isn't really around economics. It's around some social or other, uh, other issue that's driving a particular individual or a group of individuals to campaign and want a company to behave in a certain way. It doesn't have to do with the bottom line. It has to do with something that's not economic. And then you go all the way through activism that you, know, you would have read about in the papers where you know, somebody like Carl Icahn tries to take over the board of a company, change out management, or, or force a sale of the company, um, and everything in between. So let's just start right at the, right at the top of the spectrum. Um, you know, the kinds of some, there are a variety of issues that show up on corporate ballots. And, and you know, 
when I say they show up on corporate ballots, every company has an annual meeting of shareholders. And on the annual meeting of shareholders, you have the election of directors, ratification of the auditors, maybe approval of a compensation plan. Now you have say on pay because of the Dodd-Frank legislation that requires every company to allow shareholders to vote on pay. We've always had a rule, or not always, but for the last seven or eight years, we've had a rule that requires companies to let shareholders vote on equity plans. So these are the kinds of things that routinely come up on ballots. But also on shareholder ballots can be shareholder proposals. So an individual shareholder owning a certain amount of stock, it doesn't have to be that, they have to own I think $1,000 or $2,000 of worth of stock to get a proposal filed with the company. Uh, and they can propose whatever it is that they want to propose. Now, some there are rules, and the SEC has rules around what, what will actually get to the ballot and what, what won't. But again, I would say that on the ballot, there are some issues that are driven by a social issue. Someone might say, you know, we want the company to adopt a particular human rights standard. And you know you might say, well, that has an economic consequence. It probably does, but this might be a human rights organization that's not at all focused on this company and the economics of that company. They're just simply focused on they don't want workers abused in some remote part of the world. Maybe I shouldn't characterize it as a remote part of the world. Some part of the world that's not here or even here. Um, and they're focused very much on 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 those kinds of rights and they're not it's not about whether the whether that's going to make more money for the company it's really about you know a societal issue that's a meaningful issue that they want addressed and then you go down the the scale and you get things like compensation um, you know what should the what should the comp plan look like at the company next year what are the um, you know what are the what are the terms of the comp that should be that sh that, that should be given to the CEO or to the top executives Shareholders put proposals on the ballot around this all the time. They might say things like, we want the company to compensate uh, only with premium priced options or indexed options or some kind of equity, uh, equity component that you know, that shareholder specifically wants to dictate. They don't want the company giving away restricted stock or some other form of, of options. Um, that, I would argue, is moving into an economic issue. But I would characterize these first sort of buckets of issues as, as things that are really board questions. So whether the company adopts a particular um, human rights standard, or whether the company adopts uh, a particular pay package, I think those issues tend to be reserved to the board. Now shareholders have the right to put proposals up on them. And you know they can certainly send letters to the to the board. They can call and ask to speak to the independent lead independent director of the board. They can ask to speak to the corporate secretary. But these, in my view, are actually are actually board questions. The reason that shareholders hire a board is just like you know the reason why we have a Congress or a state assembly. You you know everyone can't get together and have a vote on every issue. And so you get a board and you ask them to please. Uh, look out for shareholder interests and to behave in a way that's focused on the interests of investors. And hopefully, we'll get into it later, you'll have the right to actually meaningfully elect that board. But I would argue that some questions, even in the activism spectrum, which you know I think shareholder activism is, can be a very good thing, um, I would argue some of these things really are reserved to the board. You go further down in the spectrum, and I think you get directly smack into things that are, that are absolutely within the purview of shareholders. So when it comes to the question about shareholder rights, there are lots of shareholder proposals that show up on corporate ballots about rights. Like, hey, we want to elect the directors every single year. We don't want to have, like, the US Senate you know, staggered terms, where you elect a third, a third, a third every year, every, every two years. Um, or we don't want to have, uh, we don't want the company to have a poison pill without shareholder approval. We want to be able to shell our shares of stock whenever anybody comes to offer it without the company telling us that we can't sell the, those shares. Um, at a price that we think is reasonable. We don't want the company to have that power. We want to, we want to get rid of the poison pill. Or we want to be able to actually elect the board by a majority vote standard. Most companies in the United States still today don't have a majority vote standard. They have a plurality vote standard. A plurality vote standard is you have, you have several candidates running and the top candidates win. So if you have five open seats and five candidates, and everyone gets at least one vote, they all won because they're the top five. That's the way most corporate elections in America work. 
Um, a lot of shareholders take exception with that and they've pushed really hard for companies to adopt a majority voting provision which says, hey, you can have five candidates running for five seats, but if one of those candidates doesn't get 50% of the shareholders to support them, then they shouldn't get elected. Um, sort of a novel concept in corporate governance from the last five years or so. Um, and then you go down, down from there and you get things like board composition, right? So if you believe that shareholders should have the right to actually select that board to make those decisions on their behalf, then you know, in some instances you get a board that, is, that fails. We know that there are examples in the world of, of boards that just don't get the job done. And when we, have, when we see an example of a company that where the board isn't getting the job done, it's not behaving in a way that's in the interest of shareholders. It's using money to further its own personal agenda. And you see all kinds of interesting things where you, you know, a, a board member is getting paid a consulting fee in, on the side. So they're on the board, but the CEO says to this board member, you know, you are so important. Usually this board member, by the way, sits on the compensation committee. You are so important to this company, and you're like the only person in the world who's an expert on this topic. So for a small $2 million a year, we would like to retain you for, you know, 20 hours of work to help us figure out this issue that we have because you are the only expert out there. Um, that's a board, I would argue, that may have some issues, right? And so you get shareholders um, seeking to replace board members or change out the board, and, and that's probably the most um, aggressive that you see uh, shareholder activism happening, is, is trying to go after boards um, and, and replace them with, with candidates put, it, put forth by the shareholders. Um, and again, you have everything from that all the way to things that aren't even driven by economics but that are of importance to some shareholders and everything in between. So that gives you kind of a flavor of the types of issues that we're talking about when we talk about shareholder activism. I just add one, one other thing, which is a lot of these things um, either weren't even on the menu a few years ago or were by law, but were de facto weren't really um, issues. And, and over time, all of these things have become, have become issues. For instance, say on pay, um, uh, which is something that came through with the Dodd-Frank Act, allows shareholders to make an advisory vote on executive compensation. That didn't exist a few years ago. Um, board composition a few years ago was, was generally not threatened unless there was, a, there was a, uh, a, a proxy fight and somebody coming in and trying to replace directors. But uh, more recently, you've seen proxy advisory firms advising with hold votes combined with the shift to majority voting. You're actually seeing in non-contested situations existing incumbent directors having their jobs threatened, right? So, so that board composition thing is the, the way that that is being played has changed a lot. Um, and you've got, we're gonna go through some of the types of shareholders, but you've got lots of different constituencies rifle shotting in on lots of different, different issues. So you've got the, the uh, nonprofit um, um, you know, human rights organizations coming in on some of the non-economic non stuff. You've got, you've got uh, activist hedge funds coming in on board composition and strategy and management. You've got Everybody coming at compensation, um, and and and, uh, and then a lot of organizations like Abe's and some of the pension plans um, really leading the charge on the shareholder rights. So it's it's a little bit of a scramble right now, but but um, a lot of balls are in play that weren't in play until recently. So if you just flip one slide ahead, you'll see we're going to talk a little bit about the different players, but just to give you a kind of a glimpse. When it comes to these various issues that are put on, on, by, on ballots, there's a variety of different people who are putting these, these proposals on ballots. Some are individuals. In fact, the most you get are, of these are individuals. Often on the individual category, by the way, there's about five or six people out there who put on hundreds and hundreds of shareholder proposals at companies every year. And that tends to, to capture like probably, I would guess, 95% of the individual box. Um, and then you, know, you get religious groups that want certain uh, companies behave in certain ways and they're pushing for, for those things, often in the what I would ca characterize again the non-economic bucket. It's not driven by economics, it's driven more by a social question. Um, you get labor unions often sponsoring um, shareholder proposals on a variety of issues, whether it's shareholder rights or, or labor uh, standards or other things. Um, you have public pension uh, plans, which are, you know, uh, plan Entities like CalPERS or CalSTRS, the biggest public pension funds in, the, in this country, that manage retirement money on behalf of public employees or public teachers. Um, and then you have investment advisors. Um, those could be, uh, those could be uh, hedge fund activists. They could be um, 
They could be uh, asset management firms or others. And then you have sort of, sort of an other bucket. And that's how, that's how the, uh, the sort of the players break down in terms of proposing these sorts of proposals. We'll come back to players in a second, but Mason's going to talk a yeah. little bit about the process. I'll try to accelerate this a little bit because we're going to be here all night if uh, <laughs> we don't get going here. So, so be, um, the process spectrum ranges from, from doing nothing all the way up to actively contesting and, and trying to replace board members. Um, I, I talked a little bit about this earlier. We have found over time that, that the most effective way to get what you want accomplished is behind the scenes. That's Value X philosophy. We've developed it over time. Um, it, 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 for us, it, it's, it's just a truism that people will do what you want if they like you and if you haven't publicly humiliated them. And, and, and then did some grandstanding and take, and if you don't, if you, you know, take credit publicly for everything that goes right with the company and, and throw them under the bus for everything that goes wrong, that's not a good way to get people to, to do what you want. And you're much better off, in our experience, influencing people through the power of fact-based analysis, uh, relationships, introductions, um, earning trust. And so that's how we've evolved our business model. And, and uh, we did one proxy fight in 2007, have not done one since. And, uh, and uh, we're going to get into that next week. So hopefully you guys will be back uh, next week. But this escalates um, from from that level of engagement. Uh, and, and we're not the only ones who do this. Uh, all type, different types of shareholders do this in different ways. And, and Abe will get into some of that and how his firms have done that. Uh, all, all the way up to publicly uh, drawing a line in the sand with a, with a letter that gets attached to a 13D filing. Uh, attempting to present your arguments on websites and through the media, discrediting management, and, and all the way up to proxy contests and vote now. Um, what we've thrown up here real quick is, is a little bit of a facetious list of, of the types of shareholders that are, um, that are out there and, and the, the common um, criticisms of them, uh, including my, my group. Um, and mine. So, uh, one of the ironies, I think, of the, of the activist uh, uh, world and, and, and public markets in general is that too often these groups of shareholders are balkanized and they don't interact very much. And all the hedge fund activists know each other and all the pension plans know each other and the long only asset managers know each other, but they don't cross the boundaries and, and, uh, and, and work together very much. And so there's a lot of suspicion, mutual suspicion among shareholders about each other's motivations as well as uh, a um, incentive on the part of corporations to to um, cast aspersions on the motivations of, of, of their shareholders. And so these are the the uh, um, cliches you hear about the various shareholders. You, you want me to walk through them? No, I, I want to keep moving. Okay. Um, so by the way, on, on, on the last, it's important to kind of recognize those cliches because they will they, they'll come back up as we talk about um, activism and what's happening and why certain players are doing certain things. And you know, just as with every sort of um, generalization, there's a little bit of truth in the in the generalizations, and there's often a lot that's really misconstrued. And understanding that that there's a real disconnect, especially between shareholders and companies around companies being very suspicious around shareholders and what their motives are and shareholders feeling like companies aren't really aren't really paying attention to them and aren't really focused on their interests um, and that is a theme that 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 often stimulates a lot of activism on the company side by the way shareholders have their their views as well about the companies and there's sort of a rap about companies some companies you know are all too happy to uh, engage and want to talk with you and they think oh well if you're BlackRock for example and you're one of our largest shareholders we really care about um, what you think. And then, you know, I've had companies where we might own 8, 10% of the stock, which could be as much as half a billion to a billion dollars worth of stock. And the company says, you know, listen, this is our company, and if you don't like it, just sell the shares. Why, why are you complaining? Just, you can sell your shares. We don't, we didn't ask you to invest in our company. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, there's, there's a spectrum, uh, there's a spectrum on the company side as well. And again, uh, anecdotally, I would say, well, ten years ago, most companies were in that old guard world. Today, in my opinion, the overwhelming majority of the ones that I interact with are in the new, the new world, and that has its own drawbacks, which we'll get into. It. So, Look, I would say it, it varies. The big companies are definitely in the new, in the new world. 
um, because big companies, they just they do not want uh, bad press. They do not want things distracting their businesses. They, they are under a microscope as it is. Um, and so they just, they, you know, a big company having a problem uh, where they're mistreating shareholders is just likely to cause a huge distraction for them. A smaller company that doesn't really get in the press very much and isn't really the subject of a lot of scrutiny and attention, I'd say today there's still a fair bit of companies saying, you know, thanks for calling, but just sell your shares if you don't like it. Um, and interestingly, as Mason was saying, there's like often some disconnect between groups of shareholders not really communicating with each other. Um, there's also this big sort of, you could call it a big green divide between these, these, these two groups. So um, on the top, you've got companies and all of the various advisors that advise them. You have their lawyers, their bankers, their compensation consultants. They, hire, they have proxy solicitation firms, which they hire to help them sort of get out the vote for elections where they want to, where they want to win. And there's an issue that might be contested or even non-contested election, but they want to make sure enough shareholders come out and vote so they have a good, solid showing. Um, and then you have, on the shareholder side, um, you know, their advisors. And, and on both ends, you have the same thing. You have shareholders constantly sniping about comp consultants driving up, the, driving up executive compensation. And on the company side, you've got, you've got companies complaining about those proxy research firms, like the firm that I was one of the co-founders of, Glass Lewis, or ISS, Institutional Shareholder Services, where they think that these companies are, are terrible. They're providing research and advice to investors on how to vote, and they don't know the first thing about this company. That they're not investors themselves. And, and why should they be telling investors to vote against their board? So you have, um, you have quite, a, quite a divide in this cast of characters as well. So when we go through the history lesson, there, there's a cycle that, that we've seen repeat several times, um, twice in the last 10 years, in which a scandal uh, in which a lot of money is lost on the behalf uh, of investors uh, elicits a response from Congress and the SEC changing the rules, and, and generally that's followed up by stock exchange rule changes, um, all of which uh, serve to increase transparency to the shareholders, increase shareholder rights, and uh, increase independence of boards of directors, um, which, uh, which then begets a whole round of um, new uh, tools in the activist toolbox. Um, and then time passes and the whole thing happens all over again. So we're going we're gonna to try to walk you through 100 years in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> so, so look, the, Mason started tonight by telling you that it's his view that in the last decade, 2002 to 2012, more has happened in shareholder engagement, shareholder activism, than in the 90 or 100 years before that. And I, I fully agree with him. So let's just go back in time and talk a little bit about um, the evolution in this space. So if you go back to the 20s, um, you know, really m most big companies were owned and operated by um, very wealthy individuals. You had the Rockefellers, you had the Carnegies, you had the Mellons, um, you know, you had the Vanderbilts, the Fords, and, and most, most big companies were not um, particularly widely held. Uh, and, and, and even those that were, that had stock that was publicly traded, um, they tended to have huge majority shareholders. Um, and so it was a very different time. Not unlike, by the way, the time, that you, not unlike today, in a bunch of developing markets. So in markets like a, in Asia, in China, for example, where most companies are held by a, a family and they might have 20 or 30 percent of their shares um, floated publicly, but the vast majority are controlled, and the, and the companies are controlled by by families. Um, same thing in in, in Latin America today. Um, so if so, if you go th if you go to the first uh, explosion, the first uh, uh, scandal, if you will, you had the, the the stock market crash in 1929, and then immediately following that, or within a few years, you started to have the first uh, securities regulation and the Congress and the President put in place a set of rules that um, started to require 
companies to disclose information to shareholders and behave in particular ways that were likely or hopefully intended to protect the interests of shareholders. And then, you know, you, you kind of go through a bit of a quiet period where there's not that much change. And in about 1943, um, the SEC first allows shareholder proposals to be put on corporate ballots. You don't get too many of those shareholder proposals, but they're allowed um, starting in the 40s. And then it's, then it's in the 1950s when things really start to shift a little bit, and you have the emergence of mutual funds. Mutual funds hadn't really been around that at that point. And shareholders start to value liquidity. They want privacy. And they're very happy to hold through these vehicles where the company doesn't necessarily even know that they're a shareholder. But they can, they can hold an interest in a variety of different companies. And they can sell and trade uh, relatively easily. And, it, and once that start ha starts happening, then you start to get a little bit of movement. It takes about another 40 years before you really get movement, but you start to get, um, get some, some movement. At the same time, by the way, as, as mutual funds are, are coming on board, some of the old guard, family-run businesses are starting to, the leadership of those are starting to change hands from the you know, patriarch or matriarch of that family and instead going to a professional class of managers running big public companies in, in the country. And if you forward then to, um, to the 1970s, you wind up, um, or sorry, to, well, I guess it was even in the early 70s when I think Evelyn, or the late 70s when Evelyn Davis starts coming on the scene. Evelyn Davis is, uh, was sort of probably the first and very well-known shareholder gadfly. She was one of the five people I was sort of talking about in the bucket of individuals that file shareholder proposals. She would kind of go to meetings and, and make a big fuss at the annual meeting and, and pound the table and yell at the CEO and the board and tell them that they were crooks. And she'd file shareholder proposals. And you know, at that point, she was largely dismissed. I mean, people sort of thought, well, you know, what does Evelyn Davis know? But Evelyn Davis uh, caught on. And, um, and, and bigger share groups of shareholders, like public pension funds and other institutional investors, mutual funds, started um, coming together to say, well, maybe there's something here, like there's something we could do. And at the same time as Evelyn Davis is sort of gaining steam, you got other investors like the Carl Icons of the world, who is today sort of a self-styled sort of corporate governance activist, but in the 1980s was a corporate raider, right? He was a bad guy. He would come and, you know, try to take over the company or force the company to do a sale or things that were really unheard of at that time. And um, at the same time, these institutional investors start gathering. They, they form an organization called the Council of Institutional Investors. Um, in 1985, Council of Institutional Investors wasn't very powerful. Today, it is an extraordinarily um, powerful force for advocating on behalf of investors uh, in Washington and around the country. And it's, it's pretty much every major institutional investor is a member of the Council of Institutional Investors. And they work together to sort of try to further the, the economic interests of shareholders. Um, on the company side in the 80s, companies are responding to um, these corporate raiders and the Evelyn Davis of the world starting to kind of show up at their meetings and agitate and trying to push for change. And they start, uh, Wachtell Lipton invents the poison pill. Right? You hold a poison pill basically, for anyone who doesn't know, is you know, if, you, if you go above a particular threshold, typically around 10%, if, if you as a shareholder buy one share over 10%, all of the holdings, that you, all of your shares become extraordinarily diluted by, a, by a, uh, a grant of additional shares to all the other shareholders, like many additional shares, so that your stake becomes extraordinarily diluted. So, there's a strong incentive on the part of investors never to, to, to cross a poison pill threshold because it will completely dilute their ownership stake in the company. Um, you also had ISS formed in 1985, I believe. And, and ISS uh, grows over the next uh, 25 years to be an uh, extremely powerful force. Um, and, and, and Abe later challenges them with Glass Lewis. <laughs> uh, a few years later, but but you start to see um, the professional proxy advisory industry uh, develop uh, in the 80s. Yeah, and right after the ISS formed in 1986, the first um, shareholder proposals put on a ballot by a public pension plan. 
And that really begins to change the game because it's one thing to have Evelyn Davis coming to your meeting and filing a shareholder proposal or some disgruntled you know, employee who owns some shares in a company filing a shareholder proposal. It's a totally different thing to have a, a large capital source um, step forward and say, hey, we're a big shareholder in your company and we want you to pay attention to us and we don't think you're doing it. That starts to get uh, management's attention in a really meaningful way. And um, you know, you, you, you run all the way uh, up through the 90s with you know, sh companies trying to fend off uh, corporate raiders, um, shareholders, more, more, more shareholder proposals coming up, shareholders, CII starting to gain, Council of Institutional Investors starting to gain a little traction, starting to do some lobbying in Washington, starting to really organize and coordinate. And then all the way up through the dot-com bust. And but I would argue that in the 90s was also an interesting era because this is the era of the imperial CEO, the Jack Welch's, the, the uh, Dennis Kozlowski's of the world. And, and, and again, this is anecdotal, but my observation was the uh, corporate world had an attitude of we know best and our shareholders are, are to be seen and not heard. Um, and that was reinforced, I think, by the 90s economic boom and the, and the um, stock market bubble that, that um, they didn't need to listen to their shareholders because uh, they were masters of the universe. And, and, and that's reinforced, I mean, the, the, the evidence is pretty clear. Like, at that point, you, wouldn't, you didn't have activists um, being able to replace sh uh, corporate boards. You did have a few corporate raiders, right, being able to force change at a very small number of companies. And you also had uh, lots of terminology out there like white knights, like, you know, Corporate raiders were the bad guys, and white knights were going to come in and save companies and buy them, do, or you know, provide some some solution that wasn't going to allow the corporate raider to to uh, to take the, the take the company. The over. herd of raiders was really thin by the um, bankruptcy of Drexel and and losing their access to the bond market, and it was further thin when some of them went to prison. But <laughs> there, there was a, uh, there uh, there wasn't a whole lot of activity. Icon was still out there doing things. With it really receded from the front pages of the paper. And I would argue this was sort of a, this, the 90s, now some of our people would disagree, but it was sort of like the dark ages for a little bit. There wasn't a whole lot going on. All right, so then fast forward to the 2000s, and this is where things really start to get interesting. Mason, you wanna? wanna yeah, and this is back, the, the point um, about what happened, This, if the 90s were the, dark ages, the 2000s were probably like the industrial revolution. I mean, just an incredible amount of change happened to, to, uh, uh, to the rules of the game and, and the players on, on the landscape. So when we founded Value Act, we sold a story about investing in companies and, and going on the board. And what we found was it was very, very hard to go into these imperial CEOs and, and offer your services and for them not to you know, throw you out of their office. And, and um, our initial few boards that we got on were, um, were done largely through providing capital to a, to a company. It was buying out a founder stake or a venture capital firm. So we really had to write a check directly to the company or to an owner and negotiate a board seat rather than just earn one by the virtue of being um, shareholders. And um, a funny thing happened, which is the, uh, the corporate, the, the, the dot-com bubble burst, and it was followed by the corporate scandals of Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia. Uh, you guys probably remember all these. There's too many to name. Um, and I think that was the, the, the big bang that, that changed corporate America's view about their own omniscience and omnipotence and how great they were and, and brought them back down to earth with a, with a complete um, attitude change. Uh, and, and that's what we, we profited from. We, um, it's a dig digression, but, but we went to, one of the things that enabled our company was this, this ironic situation where we went to Martha Stewart right after the uh, Enron scandal, and he said to Martha that you've never sold any shares of your company, we'd like to negotiate a deal where we buy some stock from you directly and go on your board. Because you don't know what can happen in this world of corporate scandals, you could, you know, your company might get hit by a corporate scandal and you don't want that to happen, and if you did, you'd lose everything, so sell us your stock, and she did. And about a week later, she got off an airplane on her way to Cabo San Lucas and made a call and, and may or may not have traded on inside information, and it became, the self-fulfilling prophecy happened where the scare story we'd sold came true. And so we, we bought a bunch of stock at $60 million at $15 a share, which is six. 
Um, but then when Martha was indicted and unable to serve as, as um, or, uh, officer or director, my partner Jeff Upman became chairman of the board and led the company through its darkest hours until Martha got back out of uh, prison. And so, it, what while we had lost a lot of money right out of the bat, off the bat, and it was hugely embarrassing because, as you might imagine, every Monday morning quarterback can tell you, you guys are such idiots. I mean, obviously, this, if something ever happened to Martha, you know, this, this, this company was going to be severely damaged. It happened, so everyone could tell us, you know, how, how they had foreseen this risk and what, what were we thinking. But, um, but all of a sudden, in the Wall Street Journal, Value Act Capital was being discussed as, as right in the limelight of, of, of the scandal of the day. And, and an example of shareholders stepping up to actually serve on a board and, and help a company through uh, uh, through its tough times. You know, the end of the story is that the day Martha got out of prison, they announced she was going to replace Donald Trump as the host of The Apprentice, and the stock went from like ten bucks to thirty-five dollars, and we sold it all. And today it's four bucks. But um, <laughs> the uh, the there is sort of for us there's like before Martha and after Martha because. After that period, it was the weirdest thing. I think CEOs must be very social climbing personalities or something because they, we were cool because we'd been in this Martha Stewart situation and they wanted us on the boards. But I think that, that was specific to us, but, um, but it was being, it, it, in the background, there were some very fundamental regulatory and stock exchange changes that were going on at APK. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, um, after Enron and WorldCom, um, you had Sarbanes Oxley, and then you also the exchange, uh, the the stock exchanges released a whole new round of rules, um, and to, in order to list on on the exchanges, you now suddenly had to do a whole host of things that you didn't have to do before. There were new independent standards, um, there were new uh, guidelines around compensation disclosure. Um, there was other, there were other uh, related disclosure obligations. Sarbanes Oxley bought all kinds of um, accounting related um, uh, disclosures and stock option expensing, and so there was a whole variety of things that were happening regulatorily that were stimulating this notion that what happened in the crisis was not okay, and that shareholders did need to be focused on that the board actually was there to represent shareholders, and that that. If, if companies weren't going to behave in a way that was going to make sure that boards were, were, were focused on shareholder interests, well, then regulation was going to force them to do that. And so you really had probably the biggest sort of push all at once between Sarbanes-Oxley and the exchange rules, which I, the new exchange rules, which if I recall right, came out in 2004 or 2005, um, really pushing. And then you had, um, if I remember my, my order right, you had the Disney uh, uh, vote no campaign which was a huge deal at the time. I mean, there really hadn't been um, this kind of a concerted effort on the part of a big investor. And Roy Disney himself um, was one of the people pushing for change at Disney and saying that Eisner's 20-year tenure had to come to an end, that he was, no, was not looking out for shareholders. At the time, by the way, the, the executive director of his child's preschool was on his board, I think. Um, Sidney Poitier was like chairing his comp committee or something. Um, you know, there was a there was a whole variety of uh, interesting characters, let's just say, on on the Disney board. And um, at the same time, by the way, Glass Lewis, the firm that I had, uh, was the co-founder of and built a proxy research business for, um, had just come and come on come onto the scene. And Glass Lewis was looking to cut its teeth, and and you know, show to the world that it could do a better job than ISS had been doing on providing proxy research, and we came up with this concept of having proxy talks, where we would invite people to come and, and sit down with us and talk about interesting situations, and we'd invite, if there, was a, if there was a contest, we would highlight it and have the, the management come, and we would do an hour presentation with them, and all of our clients could call and listen, and then we'd do a call with the, with the company or the dissidents um, to talk about their, their view, and then we'd write our research report and, and put it out publicly. And the first proxy talk we were able to, to do, well, we had one on a, a policy issue, but the first substantive proxy talk on a, on a, on a, on a campaign was, was Disney. And I remember my partners at the time said, there's no way we're going to get Michael Eisner to come here and do this. There's just absolutely no way. And I was like, well, I am not going to be daunted. We are going to get Michael Eisner. And I called and called and called and called. And finally, um, I talked to the proxy solicitors. I talked to his corporate secretary and convinced them that they should do that. Um, 
they came. We had a, it was a very interesting day. You know, Michael Eisner shows up in our offices, and we have this broadcast ready to go for all of our clients. We spent an hour talking with him about what was going on, asking him about this board, asking about his, you know, preschool teacher, and all these kinds of questions. And uh, needless to say, he didn't take too kindly to all those questions, that questioning. Um, and then the the dissidents came in, and they had we had a, sort of an hour back to back, although we kept them separate. They never had to see each other. Um, and 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 did a, a proxy talk with with those guys again, broadcast to all of our clients, so hundreds of different institutions on the phone listening in and uh, and ultimately we, we recommended that shareholders vote against um, against several of the board members which they did including Michael Eisner who got a, I think a 42 or 45 percent withhold vote and the lead independent director also got a huge uh, 25 percent withhold vote that was very unprecedented I mean, it just hadn't happened before that and uh, and yeah Michael Eisner still doesn't talk to me to this day although not that he would really <laughs> talk to me anyway um, and then after the Disney situation, you get uh, the Nelson Peltz comes on the scene with a proxy contest at Heinz, and there had never been a real effort to take over the board or to get like two or three seats even on the board. I think he was going for five seats. He wound up getting two or three um, on the Heinz board. It was unheard of to go after a company that that large. And I remember I was at Barclays Global Investors at the time. I think we were their largest shareholder. We were. But the company would not allow us to split our vote. We either had to vote all for the dissidents or all for the management. And the only way we could split our vote is if we actually went to the shareholder meeting and, and cast our vote at the shareholder meeting. So I flew to Pittsburgh with authority to vote 6 million Heinz shares in my pocket and went there and had to, instead of voting electronically, was what, what a big institution does so that you don't, you know, you have all kinds of controls in place, whatever. I had to go and, and um, take paper proxies for six million shares and vote by hand in the back and pick and choose from the slate. And I you know, made sure I looked at those cards like seven times before, before I turned them in so I didn't screw anything up. But um, you know, that, the, the, I'd say the, the, the Disney vote no campaign, which cost Eisner his job, by the way. He was gone from Disney within a year. And the Heinz campaign, where for the first time a, a dissident shareholder was able to get onto a huge multi-billion dollar sort of American brand, you know, company, um, and and you know, and and really make make some some headway, and bam, I mean, we were just off to the races. And and today you see as many as twenty to thirty um, public uh, proxy fights a year, um, and I'd say, you know, on average. You know, shareholders are voting in favor of dissidents 50% of the time. Um, and so about half of these campaigns wind up uh, putting directors on the board. And as Mason told you, there's a lot of others happening much be more behind the scenes. Um, and so in the, in the last decade, you've really just seen a dramatic um, change. And another, another development was going on in the 2000s, which is the, the activist hedge fund exploded. We, we, we saw our assets under management really inflect up in 2003, uh, 2004, 2005, across the $1 billion mark from having $100 million when we started, and it just took off. I mean, everybody wanted to allocate money to this, to this space. Um, you had uh, Bill Ackman at Pershing Square found his firm, I think, in 2004, right, right at the, as this uh, trend was starting. You had all kinds of salacious entertainment value from, from Dan Loeb and Bob Chapman writing very scathing letters, just insulting CEOs and dragging them through the mud. And, and every day it felt like there was another uh, activist investor um, uh, fund being formed. And you also saw the DE Shaws and the, the other big multi-strat uh, macro funds getting into the game. And, and it was a complete uh, free-for-all. The companies must not have known what hit them because one day they were kings of the world and the next day Somebody had gone and gotten their wife's divorce proceedings and, and took it out, all, taken out all the uh, allegations and published them in a 13D and spread it all over the internet. And, you know, it, it, was, um, it was the Wild West there in, in activist hedge fund land uh, uh, for a while. There, there was a shakeout that happened in the credit crunch, which is where we're heading to next. Um, but uh, but those, those, were, those were sort of interesting times. Um. You know, after the credit crisis, 
we obviously had Dodd Frank, and you had things like um, uh, sound pay become a legislative mandate for every company in the U.S. Um, Dodd Frank also uh, authorized uh, shareholder access to the proxy, which uh, is a process by which shareholders, without having to do a, a contest, without them having to actually put out their own proxy statement and, and create their own ballot, shareholders could actually potentially have the opportunity to nominate directors on the co company's ballot to sort of go through the right process and nominate you know, one, two, three directors to serve uh, and put it out in the, in the company's proxy slate, which makes it substantially less expensive for a shareholder to actually propose something than having to create an entire proxy, mail, print it, mail it, and have their own card and collect their own uh, ballots uh, alongside the company. Um, and then you also had things like the Investor Advisory Committee created by the SEC um, to put uh, actual investors meeting at the SEC talking about uh, corporate governance issues and pushing for for uh, regulation and change at the SEC that would that would really um, move to protect the interest of shareholders. Um, but I, I don't think you can overstate the change in attitude that I've seen in corporate America from from go away, we know best to to let's engage. It's it's completely night and day. And, and you know, a testament to that is we've done one proxy fight and we've been on 30 public company boards. Uh, all of the rest are just from asking. And sometimes there's a implied threat in the ask, but you know, a lot of times there isn't. And, and, uh, and, it, and it always works. Um, and that, that's sort of unfathomable from where we were when we started our firm. And the next few slides just sort of tell the story on their own, right? Staggered boards at S&P 500 companies, that means Directors elected in three classes over a period of three years, as opposed to every director serving, standing for election every year, totally transformed. Poison pills in the S&P 500, huge number of poison pills. When we entered the 2000s, today, very, very few companies with poison pills left. Um, and then there's, you know, really good uh, evidence out there. I was talking to you about this empirical research, and hopefully. Um, Evan, we're going to try to get this to you so we can put it, I, I don't know if I already sent it to you, but we, it would be great if we could get it out. So anybody who's going to come to the next couple sessions, I would really encourage you to read this article. Um, th there's, there's two versions. There's a 2008 version, and I think this one is the 2010 uh, version. And um, the 2010 sort of updated the study from 2008 and, and looked over a longer period of time. And again, I think this is, I think this is reasonably well regarded as as sort of the most comprehensive survey of literature out there on shareholder activism, and also I think well regarded as as high quality empirical analysis of what um, of of what the actual impact of shareholder activism has been. And despite Mason's story about Martha Stewart uh, living and them selling at 35 and the stock going to four, we'll have to right. talk about that after, my friend. Um, the, 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 the evidence shows that on average, shareholder activism is driving long-term value. And I think if Mason told you about the other 29 companies, right. you'd hear a lot of interesting stories, including the board that Mason's on right now, Valiant, where you know, the stock was, has, has grown exponentially since, since value has been involved. And they've been on the board. You've been on the board for what, like five years? Five years. It's been a long time. Um, all right, we're getting. We, and this is just another data point. This is a, a um, uh, there's a service called 13D Monitor. A guy named Ken Squire writes the. Uh, he's, he's sort of a activist investing junkie and uh, tracks every, everything that's going on day by day. And he has created a portfolio. It's obviously there's some cherry picking involved here, but what he considers to be premium activist hedge funds taking all the 13Ds, the 07 to 2010 returns would have been, I think this says plus 42% versus negative. Wealth, if you put your money in the indexes. So, um, this is just the last little catchphrase, um, and, and, it, and a lead into next week, which is the really interesting revolution I think is going on behind the scenes. It's not what you see in the papers, and, you, and, and it's hard for the academics to study it. And I think they do great work here at, at the Rock Center, but they have to, by the nature of their job, track data that's sort of objective and verifiable. No one really knows what's going on behind the scenes, and that's why I think what Abe and I are here to tell you about is our experiences and, and more stories. And, and uh, again, I, I can't overstate um, the uh, the impact that the threat of the the public fights and and um, 
which have been hugely empowered by regulation, has had on companies either voluntarily or sort of quasi-voluntarily with a little pressure behind the scenes changing their behavior. And, and uh, next week we'll get into that, some of the things I've seen on comp committees I've been on, uh, some of the behavior around M&A, and certainly some of the behavior around uh, CEOs and, and changing them, changing them out. So. so we gave you the background, we gave you the history, we gave you some of the information about the process, the players, um, the issues. The next, couple, next two weeks we're hoping to give you a lot of stories around what's really happening and some, some more real world examples. That's it, but happy to take questions. It's like a shareholder meeting. Thanks for the uh, the presentation. It was really good. Uh, my question is that so so your assertion is that a lot of um, the most effective way to be active as a shareholder, you have to basically do things behind the scenes. So from an individual investor standpoint. Um, what can we do? How can we get involved if it's only effective behind the scenes? So that's my question. You know, I, I, what I would say in response to that is it, if you, it, being able to do it behind the scenes can be something of a luxury. If you are a small shareholder or if you're a large shareholder but your holdings are so diverse as to be a relatively small shareholder in most companies, then working behind the scenes can be very difficult. And I would argue that that's a big reason why you see a lot of public pension funds, for example, engaged in very public activism, because while they are very large pools of capital, they, it's, it's, their capital is very diffuse. They own you know, less than a quarter of 1% in most companies, and so for them to get the attention of the board or management team can be very difficult. If you're a BlackRock, that's very different, right? You're the largest shareholder, you pick up the phone, the CEO calls you back within an hour. What is it that you want to talk about? If you're a value act and you own 5% of the stock or 10% of the stock because you're very concentrated in your portfolio, um, I would argue the same thing is true. But it's not true for everybody. And if you're an in individual shareholder, there have been examples of individual shareholders who have um, sort of tried to generate campaigns, especially using social media and engaging with, with people um, through the internet um, to try to create change. And you've seen it at, um, at, uh, at Yahoo. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a, an activist uh, individual who, who kind of got a little bit of a, a, a firestorm going, and there was a, a, a vote there that kind of went uh, withhold votes against management um, at that time that were pretty high and, and relatively unheard of for an individual kind of campaign. Um, you also saw it at RIM, um, which has experienced a lot of change. A lot of the activism that was going on at RIM has not been about, driven by any biggest shareholder. It was driven by one or two very small shareholders who were making a lot of noise and using social media as a way to connect with people and really call attention to issues. And you also see it, you know, I, I talked about the gadflies and there being just a few of them filing all these shareholder proposals, but you know, big institutions don't really care who filed the shareholder proposal and they don't care if they're crazy and go to the annual meeting and say crazy things. What they care about is the substance of the proposal and a lot of those proposals are actually really meaningful. And as an individual, you can file a shareholder proposal too and it will get judged on its merits. It won't get judged on you or whether people like you or don't like you or whatever. It'll get judged on whether people think your message is right. And that's the record out there. Well, the only, the only thing I'd add to that is every, every once in a while, there, are, there have been cases where an individual has come to us and said, here's, what we, here's a, this company, I know it really well, and here's what I think is wrong with it. And, and we'll um, take that and run with it. Most, most of the time, they're not very good ideas, but every once in a while, they are. And uh, you know, there, there's one company where it was a, a former COO who'd been, who'd been fired, and he thought the incumbent CEO was terrible, which was true. And uh, we ended up bringing him back on and in on his white horse to turn the company around. So, uh, that, that's maybe a little different than what you had in mind, but that's an example of an individual having, you know, having an idea and, and working collaboratively with someone like us. Uh, first, I want to say thank you very much for this uh, great uh, 
discussion tonight and a shout out for the Rock Center. I, I'm a trustee of a public pension plan and I came to the fiduciary college last year and it was really uh, quite beneficial. But my question is uh, relative to uh, the shareholder activism, how do you see it being impacted with the announcement by Google of issuing non-voting shares uh, as they split? Um, how do you see that impacting uh, a strategy and what it could do to uh, uh, other companies uh, being um, motivated to do, say, possibly the same thing? Um, I'll take a stab at that. For, it, it's, it's, we're such a concentrated fund that we, the governance structure is really important to how we invest, and we won't invest in things generally that have A, B shares or controlling shareholders or where your vote, is, in a sense, doesn't matter because it's, it's um, been disenfranchised somehow. Um, and, and I think over time, the market does penalize companies for doing that. I think that you've had tracking stocks that have come and gone as a fad. The ABs, are, I think, are on their, on their way out. They're usually concentrated in media companies with family ownership. Um, so I think there's a real cost to it. Uh, we would just never invest, and I think that's probably a shame for any company that wants to, wants to go that direction. Anything else? Yeah. So thanks a lot once more. Uh, it was very interesting. My question is, uh, as so you mentioned, you know, people won't buy share, and as you say, all, everything started in 19, with, with the SEC regulation of the Shareholders Act. So was there at the time? And a threat really that people wouldn't invest anymore in companies. And when regulation have expanded, was it each time because there was a major threat of that, or was it more a process or a lobby process at the beginning? Uh, I wasn't in the business back then, but the, uh, <laughs> what I've been told is that the large the, the Securities Acts of 1933 and 34 were largely in response to fraud and misrepresentation that was going on in the bubble of the 20s, and, and so a lot of those regulations had to do with um, uh, both the exchanges and the companies, but on the company side, how, how, how you had to disclose information. Um, and that was sort of round one um, of, a, of a series of dominoes that ended uh, with, with where we are today. And I think the same thing is true in the 2000s. I mean, I, I don't, it, it wasn't that SEC, it wasn't Sarbanes-Oxley and and the exchange rule changes that drove shareholder activism, it was outrage. It was outrage that drove the SEC to act and Congress to act. And it was outrage that sort of opened the door for shareholders to sort of organize and say, hey, wait a minute, we're just not going to tolerate companies behaving this way. And so I think it was mutually reinforcing, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it was, just like back then, it was sort of the stock market crash and the devastating impacts on the American economy that that created outrage. I wouldn't. I would say that that was probably more the driver, uh, the outrage, than anything else. Yeah, we'll go here and then here, and then you know I know it's getting a little bit late, but we're happy to stick around for for a few minutes and talk okay. to anybody too. But it's okay. We'll just yes. So you, you talked a little bit earlier about um, the the different uh, investor groups communicating. Um, hedge funds, activists with, with institutional investors. I guess one of, one of the interesting questions is um, the two groups may or may not have different capital bases. So, you know, an institutional investor can take a five, seven year view of a business, an activist, you know, Value Act probably can because you're on the board of companies for five years, but probably many activists don't have the fund terms or the lockups that allow them to do that. So in cases where that's the case, how do you think through kind of alignment of interest between different investor groups? and whether that they can work together or they can't work together. Well, um, one of the things we didn't talk about but is really important to this, understand in this discussion is the, the rules of the game are set up to inhibit communication and collaboration. There's a, uh, the um, Section 13 of the Securities Act is, is um, governs how, how groups can be formed. So if you're going to work in concert to um, vote a certain way, you got to declare it and, and, and file a 13D if you're over 5% of the shares outstanding. <coughs> um, a group will also trigger a poison pill, which is everyone's, that's the you know electric fence you don't want to touch, right? So most compliance departments force you to stand a mile away from the electric fence. And 
um, when you have institutional investors that may, somebody may own 10 and somebody may own five, you know, it, 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 we've, we've reached a place where everyone's afraid to talk about, about anything um, uh, in, in, in my experience. Now, over time, that's thawing out and people are getting a little bit more reasonable about how they communicate. That's, that's one issue. The capital-based thing and the sort of suspicion about people's motivations is, is another issue. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things that we learned in our proxy fight was we are much better aligned uh, to your point, with with the Black Rocks and the T Rope prices and the Calpers and the the, the longer term oriented shareholders, because the the hedge fund community and the other activist hedge fund communities seem to be very interested in transactions and generating a big hit and moving on, right? And they lost interest in longer term plays, and so it was hurting cats because you you try to talk to them and get them kind of corralled, and then they'd get bored and sell the stock and move on, and they wouldn't be there anymore. So we found that that having relationships like uh, with Abe or, or, or people like Abe was much more powerful because they'd stick around and they and they'd uh, uh, they'd do the right thing for the long term of the company and even more importantly they had a tremendous credibility with management. Somebody who just showed up yesterday and bought a bunch of stock doesn't have the same credibility with management and a board that, that somebody who's owned the stock for 20 years does. It's just it's just I don't know. We can debate whether that's right or not. But it's just the way the world works that that longer term shareholders get 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 a uh, taken a much more seriously. So. So we've fumbled around to try to figure this out, and that's how we've, we've aligned ourselves to your point with the, with the same time horizon. And I guess the only other thing I would add is, you know, the, probably the biggest reason that um, a proxy campaign contest fails is because of this misalignment. So, um, you know, shareholders get to decide. At the end of the day, when you have a proxy contest, it's up to the shareholders. And... And you know most big institutional investors are thinking relatively long term, and the biggest question that I would ask—I mean, usually when an activist shows up, you can be pretty sure there's something going on at that company, right? There's there's some big spotlight to shine on either the way they're being governed, you know, someone's preschool teacher on the board, or they're you know spending money in ways that are just absolutely outrageous and not at all in the interest of investors. I mean, there's something usually going on, and then the question becomes, well, who's going to best fix it? And the management team always shows up with religion. They got religion. They realize, oh, we didn't mean to. That was a really bad idea. But we know now, and we really appreciate that somebody like Mason showed up and you know helped us think about this. And we're all good. You don't need to vote for those guys. We're good. Right. And then you get the activists come in, and the activists will say, no, 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 you cannot trust those guys. Those are the same guys that robbed you, fleeced you blind for the last five years. What are you doing trusting them? And we say to them, well, okay, we get that, but like they seem like they're actually doing so. They have a five-part plan and three new board members, and they've changed everything, and they're never going to do it again. And you guys are going to get in there, and you want to sell the stock in like six months, and you're going to do a bunch of crazy stuff that's going to pump up stock price maybe in the short term. But we don't think that's going to leave the company very healthy for those of us who are going to be there in 10 years. And, and so this is, a, this is a question shareholders have to ask themselves. And you know, it turns out that the value acts of the world who ha who are well aligned with the institutional investor community and do um, do tend to be there for the long term and do tend to think about leaving a company at least as well off, if not much better off than they found it. Um, that matters, and and you know, um, it's also a reason why I think these guys have the luxury of not having to run proxy fights because companies don't want to go up against them; they don't want to lose. Um, so. That's what I'd say. Did you, one last question? Okay, no. So thank you. We'll, we'll be around. I'm happy to talk. Okay.